Fantastic. Yay. So welcome everyone. Yes, oh, I so think nice DJ, DJ Apolline. <laughs> DJ Apolline, it's Friday, DJ folks. Apolline. You know how we do this. This is for people with chalacha, people with kalaka, yeah, nandi walanya, nandi kalanya. It gon' make you feel better. This can take away palaba. This can take away wala. It gon' make you feel better. <laughs> I mean, I love the spirit of Friday. Ooh. Energy. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> welcome everyone welcome welcome once again to our monthly leadership happy hour session happening every last friday of the month you're so welcome um it's so good to see you and um we're gonna have so much fun today we're gonna learn so much there's exciting news so it's gonna be an amazing session as uh, if this is the first time you're seeing me let me introduce myself again my name is muriel and I'm the social media manager for Vusar Africa. And I'm here with Taka. You all know Taka, our CEO. And I'm also here. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Taka. And Hi. I'm, here with... <laughs> I'm here with Apolline. Apolline, our COO. Hi, Apolline. Hi. Oh. Hi. Hi. And I'm here with also Lydia. Lydia is our program manager. And Lydia is also managing our people on Facebook. Hi, people on Facebook. Thank you for joining us today. Nice, nice, nice. So um, Lydia also has uh, put a link in the comments. So if you're new and you're not yet part of our leadership happy hour, I mean, our leadership tribe, please click on the link. So you will be able to get like bi-weekly tips to help to guide you on this leadership journey. So the link is in the chat. Um, yes. So Lydia is going to put the link in the chat in a bit. So um, Taka, we have exciting news. Your book is out. I am so excited. <laughs> Congratulations again. Your book is out. And I'm so excited because today you're going to give us like a little preview. You're going to tell us a little bit more about the book. And we're so blessed to have one guest. I mean, one of the outstanding leaders that you've interviewed in the book. So we're so blessed to hear from him as well. So shall we get started? I hope everyone is yeah. excited. Yes. Yay, yay, okay. yay, yay, yay. So, <laughs> so thank you, Muriel. And, mm. and greetings. Huh? I see so many wonderful leaders, some of you who have joined us every single time and, and others who I'm seeing for the first time. Huh? But and I see people from so many different spaces, which is such a recognition of how wide our leadership spans on this continent. Huh? So I'm seeing folks from right here on the continent. I'm seeing folks from here in Accra. I see folks from the US. So Sarah and Dorothy, I see you. I see folks from Nairobi, I think Jacqueline and Julius. Let us know where you're from, Julius. Huh? Um, I recognize Meheza in Togo. I think, I wonder which Barbara that is who has joined us. Do let us know. So do let us know where you're joining us from. We have Rachel who's joining us from the UK. Um, we have Maureen joining us from Uganda. So we're really quite all over, both on the continent and in the diaspora. So as you said, Muriel, we also have two guests. Actually, there's two, huh? but one is quite, there's Gavin, who I'm going to introduce later, who's featured in the book. But there's someone else who's featured in the book who's quiet here. I'm going to take her later for the launch, huh? for the virtual launch. And that is Sarah Mukasa. So Sarah, give a wave. Sarah is also one of those outstanding leaders who's featured on the book. Huh? Um, before I get into the news, it would be so lovely for folks, if you can, 
I know it's Friday. You may have your 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 Friday faces on. You may have taken off your your wigs, your your what, your eyelashes. Who knows what? But it would be so lovely to see you. So if you can, just so it feels like we're having a conversation, do turn on your camera so we can see you and have a conversation with you. So if you can and your network permits, do turn on your cameras so we can see you. Eh? Right now, I'm only seeing, aha, thank you, Maureen. Oh, Maureen, were you coming on? There you are, thank you. There we go. I'm seeing folks start to come back on. It so makes such a difference to see folks and be able there. Rosalind, thank you. I see you. Nice. So the rest of your network coming. Ah, Bob's. Nice to see you, Dorothy. Nice to see you. All right. So Muriel, over to you. What did you ask me a question before I, I, I deflected and went into other things? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's so nice to see that many people with us this afternoon. Thank you, everyone. So my question, Taka, what is the title of the book? What is it about? Tell us more about the book. Ah, yes. So the book is entitled Leadership in Africa Redefined. Okay. And it really is about shifting the narrative about leadership in Africa. Uh, um, the, the work that I do, I come across so many amazing leaders. Huh? Robert and I just came out of a session um, with a media company that exposed us and really we were learning from so many amazing leaders. But yet, the story I was hearing about leadership on this continent was one of thieves, corrupt politicians, autocrats, you know, it's the usual narrative we hear about leadership in Africa where we are defined by the worst of us. Huh? And I felt that was just half the story. So, so really this, what this book seeks to do is to capture the lessons and the examples. And I selected 30 amazing outstanding leaders on this continent, as I mentioned, Gavin and Sarah are examples of them and really see what is it they have to teach us so they could be examples for us about the leadership that this continent needs. So that's what it's about. Nice, nice. And I love that you're given a different perspective because of course, like you said, everyone, even me, when I think about leadership in Africa, I'm just like, oh, Jesus, what is that? But I love that you're giving us a different, a more positive perspective on the whole thing. So why now? Why are you, why do you want to launch a book like that now? Mm. Mm -hmm. I think what we're all finding is that at this time more than ever, I think globally, given what we're seeing in the world today, I think not just post the pandemic, but also what we're seeing in terms of what's happening in Ukraine. But if I bring it much closer to home, huh? when I see the level of conflict on this continent, when I see issues around governance, when I see the amazing things that the youth have to offer, when I start to see all the potential this continent has to offer, I think the key thing that's needed to unleash all the power and potential this continent has to offer is leadership. Mm -hmm. But it's not any type of leadership. It's not leadership that's been crafted in the business schools in, in Manchester or in London. I mean, some of that can be relevant, but it's saying that we too on this continent have a story to tell about the leadership that's needed for this continent. Eh? And I think one of the big frustrations I often have is um, many of you who know the work that I do know that I have to spend a lot of time reading. Huh? to make sure I'm on top of leadership principles, best practice, and really support our the, our, the clients we work with, with those. But often I would find like, ah, what are these books I'm reading? They, again, they're designed in the global north to talk about situations that were not really relevant to our context. And I think all of you who are leaders in this, on this call know that leadership is highly situational. Huh? And unfortunately, there was this huge gap where we were not getting the ideas and theories about how to deal with leadership in this continent from people who are on this continent. And yet, they, I kept encountering these amazing leaders who had so much to share. So, so in summary, I think at this moment, more than ever, we need leadership. And the leadership we need is one that we can learn from 
right here on this continent. So I hope this book really provides those kinds of examples that we can learn from. Oh, nice. But what do you want to accomplish? Like when someone picks up the book, what do you want them to, to feel, experience, learn exactly? Mm. Well, there's a couple of things. I mean, you will see when you all finally get the book, you will see that the book is, is, is very practical. Huh? Because what I found is that um, theory is good. So I share quite a bit of theory and framing and conceptualizing. But what I would really like is for people to be able to take that theory and put it into practice. Right. I would like for them to, there, there's lots of stories I share in the book from people like Gavin, Sarah, and lots of the other leaders featured in there. I would like to see themselves in those leaders. I would like to feel, I would like them to feel that the kinds of challenges and the way those leaders responded to those challenges offer some learning for them, but most of all, I would love for them to start to practice huh? the mm. type of leadership that's exemplified. Huh? So I, I, as somebody who consumes a lot of self-help books and those kinds of things, I know that thing of you read and you're like, eh, practicing is another thing. Huh? So what I would really love is if people read and then take that into actually shaping their mm -hmm. leadership practice. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. But I'm so excited to hear about because we because I know the book is about stories from like outstanding leaders. And we're so happy that we have one of them with us today. So would you like to introduce our guest and tell yes. us a bit more? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I'm very mm -hmm. excited to tell you about Gavin, Dr. Gavin Anderson, eh, who is one of those who's featured in the book. Eh? So so Gavin grew up in Botswana. Huh? And when studying in Johannesburg, he joined the emergent Black South African trade union movement and was banned by the apartheid government in 1976. So you can see Gavin is inside and out an activist at heart. One of those leaders who has a long history of commitment to social change on this continent. So just doesn't talk, just doesn't teach. He's been in the trenches actually trying to shape and make a difference. Huh? Um, through his several businesses, um, Gavin aims at strengthening community organization for sustainable livelihoods and prosperity, and is very involved in social enterprise, regenerative, regenerative agriculture, and rural development. Huh? Um, more specifically, Gavin co-founded the Seriti Institute, which strengthens community organization, which is something I find so interesting about Gavin, his ability to work almost like that national level but also at a very granular level at that community level. Huh? So also quite a strong OD specialist and is the co-creator of Kwanda, a reality TV show where Learning Cap provides insights for teens to achieve a community makeover. But there's something else I need to tell you all about Gavin. So last time you met Shola, who, hello Shola, I see Shola has joined us today from the Gambia. Hey Shola. <laughs> who I told you all that Shola is my coach and Shola has yes. been coaching me for a oh, while. Eh? Mm -hmm. But there's something about Gavin. The reason I am a coach today is because of Gavin. When I was the country director at Action, and I share this in the book, when I was the country director at Action Aid, and I will tell you at moments when I was flailing huh, and thinking, oh gosh, you know, I, I, I know how to raise funds. I know how to do policy influencing. I know how to do work around gender. But this thing about leading others, I am not sure about. This thing about leading change. And again, there's somebody in this, on this call who I have to really honor for helping me along that journey, Janet. Janet Mawil, give a wave. Janet was the country director of Action Aid in Tanzania at the time. And I remember her saying, okay, Taka, do this, do this. You can think about this is how you can structure. She, she was so helpful. Huh? But then at some point I thought, gosh, I really need in-depth help. Huh? And somebody says, well, why don't you get a coach? 
And I had met Gavin previously and I knew he did coaching and I approached him. I said, would you be my coach? Can we have a formal arrangement? And I tell you, it was so powerful in helping me gain clarity of how I first needed to grow as a leader, but also the kinds of things I needed to do for the organization as we went through change. Mm-hmm. And when he was done with me, I said, ah, ah, me too. I want to do that thing that he also did. Mm-hmm. So, so, so Gavin, thank you so much <laughs> for being an example that I was able to model much, much later. Huh? Nice. And, and as he said, so Gavin is featured in the book for a number of things, but really I would like to, can I ask, pose a question to Gavin then? Huh? Um, yes, related indeed. is that okay yes indeed we're so, so excited to hear more about gavin yes <laughs> gavin is there anything i've missed about you you've been so generous Taga. good evening to everybody very happy to be hi, with Tag. you hi gavin so so gavin my my question to you and folks you could see from my my background uh, the, that i shared about gavin gavin has always been at the forefront of social change and again muriel you asked me this question about why now and and when i think about what's happening on this continent at this moment i start to think how we need so many leaders who are experienced with who are willing who are courageous enough to be part of societal change. So Gavin, my question to you is this. eh? In the book, I cite you as an example of courageous leadership. You're operating in a space of structural inequality. I did mention, but Gavin is currently lecturing at the University of Cape Town Business School. So he's based in South Africa. And all of us know the kind of structural inequality you're dealing with in South Africa. But as I've said, you've been at the forefront of social change. Huh? What about you, Gavin, enables you to lead change at both that societal level, but also the very granular community level? What is it about you? <laughs> Thank you, Tega. Um, yeah, it's a hard question. So I think first, how I see Uh, courageous leadership is first, or what one needs, what it is, is you first will need a perspective on on the society you're in. So you've said that we live in a country with the greatest inequality in the world with a history of deep uh, trauma, racial oppression. And so the one thing is to understand and and work out where one stands with that. What, 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 What do you feel about it? And, And then the key thing is, what is my purpose? Why am I here? What do I need to do? And once you have that, it's possible in any diff, any in different situations to, as you said, leadership situational. There are different power relations within any situation. And first of all, to to plumb the depths of your will. What do what would I want to do here? And then to discover the skill to do that. And and working with the will and the skill, that's the st- a strategy then that you use, that, you, that you're coming to. Um, and and uh, with an individual, you might be operating differently uh, than, than in, a, in a, a large societal setting. With individuals, I found that the key is to maintain what I call a ternary orientation. So you're not talking about you you know, if you're confronting power, dealing with someone with power, is not to say, you're, you're, this is what I think, this is what you think, to get into a, a binary interaction, but instead to look on in a ternary way that, okay, what is we trying to do? What are you trying to achieve? Look at this. What about this? What about this? So that's the ternary. With societal um, uh, issues and, and organization, it's to really learn different ways of creating conditions for, for people to organize on their own behalf, to realize their own agency, to work together. So, okay, what equips me to do that? <laughs> or what, what, what makes me, what enables me to lead societal change? I think, I think there are two things. There's luck and learning, constant learning. <laughs> so the luck is that I was brought up, as you say, in Botswana. And I was brought up at a time when Sretsi Khama was leading us to independence. 
and in every household, in in on the radio, in the newspaper, uh, in every every shop, in every village, in all the, the emergent civil service, there was talk about the kind of country that we would create, well aware of the history of colonialism that we came from, and about the new country, the new values, what we would like. At that moment, I was sent to boarding school to finish my education in South Africa at the height of apartheid. And I saw this completely different view on life, and a different way of thinking society should be, and different way of judging people, and the ideology of, of supremacy, <laughs> the ideology of racial supremacy, racial superiority. And, and so at a young age, I learned about ideology, that the world isn't like this or like that. It's how we choose to see it. And similarly, situations and organizations are, are about uh, are a lot is about how you see them, how you choose to see them. And I also realized that very few people understand that. And that it's incumbent, there's an obligation on me to therefore do something about that, to, to try and help bring a different viewpoint on what could happen. And in fact, being a white African, coming after 500 years of the most cruel oppression from Europe and, and uh, um, structural humiliation of, of people in different ways, I have an obligation that uh, the ancestors who, who live through me do their very best to, to make amends. To, to offer something to society. So I, I then have, I see myself, uh, I see courageous leadership then as living my purpose in service to society and to an emergent uh, possibility. Um, so, okay, we're in, you mentioned in my twenties, it meant getting involved in where there was organization happening. It was the time of the black consciousness movement. Workers were starting to organize. I became engaged there. And, and uh, okay, I got banned for five years and learned about how to organize underground. And I learned what it's like to, to be seen as an enemy of the apartheid state. So, so constantly organizing against, but I learned a lot of organizational skills. Then going back to Botswana, I realized that organization is not only against, it's you've also organized for. And in fact, that is the key for all of us is what are we organizing for? What is the new society we want to bring into being? As climate is, is being destroyed, as, as uh, we see this growing inequality across the world, not only in, in uh, South Africa and Botswana, what are we challenged to do? What are we trying to emerge? What are we, we trying to learn? And, and um, yeah, so, um, I think, I hope that's, yeah, so courageous leadership in that thing is to really constantly plumb your depths to see what's, what's called from me at this time. And, and um, I've learned that, that uh, like every leader in the planet, I, I have moments where I get things completely wrong. And so the key is, is to, to learn, to reflect, and to learn with others, to do, to do a critical reflection, to try and understand what's going well and why. What is, why, why, is, why is it going well? Also, what's not going so well and why is that? So out of the two, to, to understand um, what we need to do. And, and doing that with others is, is always um, very helpful. So- um, Powerful. Yeah. Now you all see why Gavin is featured in the book, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's so much there, my goodness. Let me pull up a couple of things that, that really deeply resonated with me that, that you said, Gavin. Thank you. Um, there's something you said about the world is not black and white. It's about how we choose to see things. Hmm. And, and recognizing that our experience is filtered through our mindset and the choice of the perception that we take. And I'm imagining that a lot of leadership 
is around raising people's awareness on the fact that they're seeing things in particular ways that are either helpful or not helpful. Huh? But I love this thing, so I, I lift that up. I find that really interesting. Yeah? There's something else you said about um, the whole issue around finding your purpose. And you will see that in the book, one of the, the chapters I have is around leading with purpose. Because if there's one thing I find I found quite common across many of the leaders that I interviewed is that just the way Gavin described, huh, these are not people who sought to occupy a leadership position. So these are not people who are like, oh, I'm into the here and I am this role, I'm going to move up to the next and then I'm going to be MD in it. I find the leadership that this continent needs are not people who are personally ambitious for themselves, but who look at a situation and then think, what am I called to do? So their calling to leadership is calling to a purpose. There's something bigger than themselves. Huh? And, and I think that's the spotlight. We really want to shine on the type of leadership we need at this moment. As Gavin said, they're called. Huh? But they're acutely aware, and I, and I liked the way you described this situation. Huh? It's, it's the way you perceive, you start to see certain things like power relations. I think many of us are operating in spaces of great privilege. And it's quite easy as we think we're hustling from day to day to forget about this privilege and not pay attention to, to the power relations that have enabled us to exist in these privileged positions. So I, I love that you're bringing up that, that analysis. And finally, what I would love to, to lift up is your, your focus on learning. Again, the chapter on um, the book also emphasizes this thing about learning. And I think I even feature you as one of those who focuses on learning. Because I always say, as a leader, the day you stop learning is the day you should just give up your leadership role. You are not helpful to anybody. Mm -hmm. Because I think the world keeps changing. So we need to keep learning about what we need to do differently. But more importantly, also learning about ourselves so we can be of better service. So I love how you lift that up. But even what you said, you said, it's you learn with others. And that's something I'm taking away that it's not just about Taka learning and what's Taka, but it's almost how do I support an environment where we're learning together with others so that our actions can really be lifted up. So, so thank you, Gavin, for that. Maybe I have one final question for you, a bit related to some of the issues you've raised. Um, you know, this week we, we celebrated AU Day. Huh? And um, again, when I look at the state of affairs on this continent, I, I have often said, I don't know whether to weep or whether <laughs> to, 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 I don't know. I always want to remain hopeful <laughs> because I think there are many things that should give us hope. Huh? But, but I think what is becoming so clear to me is that our polit the type of leadership we need right now cannot really be totally offered by those in political roles, eh? by political leaders. And you, Gavin, as someone who's done quite a bit of leadership at the community level and other spaces, eh? um, what do you think? Is there something about leadership in these other spaces eh? that can make us hopeful? that we can look to, so that we're not just looking at our political leadership to, to get us out of this mess, but we can start looking for leadership in other spaces. What, what are you seeing in these other spaces that we can look to, to learn from, not just learn from, but also um, be hopeful about? Thanks. Um, okay, so a step back, you know, I said that a situation is also how you how you see it is is quite important, and and I think the one thing to reflect on is how we see society, the organization of society, and how we organize instinctively ourselves. So, for the last about sixty years, there's been increasingly a model of organization which I call bounded organization. It's bounded by the purpose, the, the mission, the, the uh, reason for being. So there's those in the organization, those outside the organization. And we, you know, so there's the 
there's an organization's uh, key uh, selling point, competitive advantage, what, what, and it's very carefully defined and organizes, organizations plan, they do strategic planning around that. And all the issues that are not part of the organization, uh, we, it's like, who's going to do that? Oh, is someone else will do that. And if pushed, yeah, but who's going to do that? The government will do it. Yeah. So um, sexism, racism, classism, able bodyism, climate change, inequality, all of these, it's not for our organization. That's, you know, somewhere government will do that. And then we say, no, well, United Nations will do it. So we have, a, we have an idea that the key issues in society will be, you know, there's this kind of pyramid with the folks at the top and everybody tries to get there to control the power and the policy and everything. The trouble is that those organizations, government is also bounded. So you have the different ministries and departments and the directorates within it and the levels of government and everybody is very involved in, organize, in their organization and societal organizations ignored, or it, we don't come to terms with it. So almost everywhere across the, the continent, you see governments flailing. So then the, the comes another mythology with the private sector, because the, we've got small enterprises, enterprises will develop and they'll sort it out. So it doesn't work either. The market doesn't solve inequality the market doesn't solve uh, poverty. So, so what, we, what I, I've started to see is that, that what's really needed is that we work across, or that we need collaboration across organizations, between organizations, between government and, and business, between those working in the civil domain. And, and I mean, uh, you know, neighborhood initiatives, learning circles, spiritual fellowship, um, all kinds of, of uh, activity circles. And, and so here's the thing is that every single community that I've ever been into, no matter if, they struck, if they're suffering from daily structural humiliation, poverty, terrible gender-based violence, um, absolute hunger, still for the, the miraculous thing about human beings is that in there, there are these gems of leaders, these remarkable people who are able to, to uh, really give, get things happening, to give of themselves, uh, to, to get a flow happening between different kinds of organizations and institutions. And in fact, what I've started to feel is that the, the key is to, to uh, uh, bring into being different kinds of activity, that it's in the activity that new leadership gets revealed, that new possibilities emerge. We can't uh, learn and plan it beforehand. It's not a, it's not a log frame. It's, it's um, something that, that is emergent and, and you start to see leadership as practice, you're learning it, provided you always that there's that space for shared reflection for, for, for uh, together saying, okay, folks, what do we, what, how's it going? What, what, what are we getting right here? What are we not getting well yet? It's going so well yet. And so that's, that's it's apparent contradiction because successful organization is when this, you're in flow, it's, everything is, it, you're in process. It's just, it's humming, it's like, you know, when I joined your call tonight, I, I joined it for others who didn't know, I joined two, three minutes early, and there was this Busara team, just buzzing, happy, just doing their thing. And it's like, oh, good, I can, I, I'm at home, yeah? So that's the flow. And yet I know that you won't have that flow unless there are moments where you're sitting quietly and say, okay, guys, what, what's happening? What do, we, what do we need to look at here? You know, what are we learning? So same with communities, provided there are those spaces for reflection, for saying, are we, are we getting it right? What, what else can we do? Who are we not involving here? Uh, the, you know, once you do that, you see these the remarkable, really remarkable people. I don't know how uh, leadership emerges, except it does. They always, these leaders everywhere, and they get caged often 
because it, um, we now start to know, okay, but who's supposed to do this? Okay, which government department do we involve? And, and actually, you can get it, it can become bureaucratized and, and in, in trouble. So as reflecting today, we have a lot of criticism of our arts and culture minister, who I've met and is a very fine man. But it is artists who openly on Facebook say, we hate you, please go, we hate you, you know. So there's this kind of paradox of a very decent person doing his best. And, and some of the finest, our finest uh, intellects in the country just being rude to him. And I was thinking that, you know, implicit in the idea of a, of a ministry of arts and culture is that we've got to come up with plans that we, that we make, you know. So they'll come with these plans and they don't coincide with the emergent artistic process of the country. And, and uh, yeah, so, so I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rambling on a bit here. But, but uh, essentially, we need, yeah. to, we need to look for new patterns of organization, not to nice. fall into these, these, the, what's been handed down and what is constantly uh, taught us. And, and Taga, you, you said that as an OD specialist, and indeed, I, I spent years doing organization development as a way of life. And, but the, I realized that the assumption is that if all organizations do well, society is going to do well and yet societal organizing is is subtly different from just organizing within an organization so mm. yeah yeah powerful powerful lots to think about lots of things that that got me thinking that i hadn't thought about it in this way some things that i i are really striking me is this ability to work across boundaries, organizational boundaries, sectoral boundaries, industry yes. boundaries, status boundaries becomes a key yes. thing around the leadership that we need for these times. Huh? Because too many, we're, we're too bounded, as you said, in these boxes. And these boxes, we can't adjust some of the, the big real systemic challenges that this continent is facing when we're stuck in these boxes. So I'm, I'm hearing you say there's a need for that leadership. What I'm also hearing you say, which I'm finding so interesting, is this thing about leaders emerging from the activity and the practice. Yes. Many of us are so used to leaders emerging from appointments, formally as director, superintendent, chief operating officer. That, that's our mode of understanding leadership. But I think this is a lot more shared, distributive, and almost this idea of emergent. But caveated with that, it also needs to be grounded in this constant reflection huh, to ensure that we're, we're getting it right. That becomes a key factor. But ultimately, we need new patterns of organizing. So powerful. All right, Muriel. Gavin and I have talked enough. I think we have to open it up. But this is <laughs> Gavin, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm back yeah. to you, Muriel. Huh? Well, thank, thank you, you so much, Gavin and Nataka. It was so insightful. Um, so before I open it up to the, you know, I open the floor to questions. I have one more question for you, Taka. What did you learn about yourself while writing the book? Like in the process of writing such a powerful book meant to teach people the best way to lead with their heart, with purpose. What did you learn about yourself? I guess one big thing is I have still so much more to learn. I think that was a big thing because I kept feeling like as you know, as I keep talking to many of these amazing leaders, each day there's more stuff that I need to learn. Huh? But there's another thing I realized about myself. I have to confess because many of you I know on this call, I'll tell you this whole thing of putting out a book is very scary. And so I'm also contending with my own, almost my own fears around putting your message out there. And, and learning that sometimes it's about, you know, saying, all right, I'm going to offer this. I see, to, see this as an offering of my thoughts and perspectives and managing some of the, what will people say around it? So it, it is a process. I hope to become people like um, Gavin and others on, who have done two, three books, and maybe I'll get more used to it as, as time goes on. But really, the biggest thing was learning, but I still have more to learn about leadership. Well, I'm so excited to read this book. I really want to read it. <laughs> now I want to read it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So let's open the floor to questions. 
uh, we want to hear what you guys think. Um, what do you have to ask to Taka when it comes to the new book? Um, what are your questions, really? Um, so, or comments, or they can also be to, comments. To I, I just saw a comment um, from Dorothy. She says, when we read stories written in our context, we know that those stories are also possible for us. So that's amazing because you're telling stories from like an African point of view, like African leaders. And when we read that, we feel like, oh, if they're able to lead like that, exactly. I'm also able to lead exactly. the same way in my own small community. So that's amazing. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, keep on the comments coming. Let us know what you think about this session that we've just had. If you have any comments for like Gavin, any question, for Taka, go ahead and unmute, put your video on. We want to see you. Tell us what you think. <laughs> or should I start calling names? Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, yes, oh, I would Dorothy. love to know. Yeah, Do okay. Dorothy has yeah. her hand mm -hmm. up. Yeah. Come on, Dorothy. <laughs> Hey, Dorothy. You're on mute. Hi. You're on mute. Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, so um, thank you, uh, uh, Gavin, for that. It's 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 so heavy that you sort of have to let it kind of sit in your mind. And I know I'm going to be thinking about everything you said for the next few days, just trying to distill and, and, and to understand the depth of it. Uh, but um, um, uh, you've certainly triggered many thoughts for me. Uh, but come, I want to come back to, to Taka. Uh, and my question is on the book, Taka. Uh, I'm wondering how, how did you, I, I know you, you mentioned that you were looking for positive examples um, and sort of people with different uh, ways of leading on the African continent. But uh, when, what, what can we expect in terms of the, um, the, the diversity uh, of uh, leadership styles or even of uh, individuals that you have represented in your book. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dorothy. You know, it's interesting when I started um, interviewing folks before I knew it, I was just interviewing Ghanaians. And I was like, ah, ah, Taka, you're writing a book on leadership and all you're going to write about is these amazing Ghanaian leaders. And then I had to pause. It was just because I those were that's who I was seeing around me. Eh? And so I realized that I needed to capture really the wide range. So the kind of mix of leaders we interviewed, we, we made sure we, you know, had male, female, um, transgender. We also had um, East, West, South, because we know ourselves as well on this continent. All of a sudden, the Southern Africans will be like, oh, you have too many East Africans, East Africans too many West Africans. Um, so it was also trying to get a regional balance. It was also trying to get a balance in terms diversity in terms of age. Huh? Again, leadership, as you could see from our previous sessions, has been quite ageist. Huh? So we've always thought of leaders as older people. Huh? So I made sure I had both older folks and younger folks. And then, of course, there's the language factor. Huh? Again, narratives I find on this continent have been shaped quite heavily by us Anglophones. And it's trying to say, can we also have narratives being shaped by those who, and forgive me for using this colonial language, Anglophone, Lusophone, but it was also a mixture because I think sometimes the experience uh, because of our colonial histories, the experience and nature of leadership has been different in Portuguese speaking, in, in French speaking and in, in the English speaking. Yeah? So I wanted to also get that diversity. Um, Dorothy, the diversity is also across industries and sectors. So I made sure I got some private sector folks, some public sector folks, and some, you know, some non-for-profit folks, you know, people like Gavin and Sarah who are in the non-for-profit non world. So it's been quite, um, and then of course, well-known and less well-known. Uh, because again, the idea of leadership is not just famous people doing big things. I've also featured people who are doing things in their little corners quietly. So Dorothy, I hope that answers your question. Uh, yeah, just may I add a footnote <laughs> with permission? 
Oh, it's Absolutely. Frozen. Absolutely. Okay, great, great. Um, so uh, it sounds to me, and I'm very excited, uh, Taka, to, to uh, read the book, uh, that you're actually helping us, uh, you're busting the stereotypes um, around leadership and helping us to uh, think about leadership in, in a completely different way, a sort of broaden uh, definition. So that's what I'm concluding from what you just said. So thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. And, you. and if I may, there's a question from Leandra in the, in the chat. Huh? Oh, yes. What are the key values all great leaders have in common? I mean, I think he means all the leaders that you've interviewed in the book. What do they have in common? What are the key values they all have in common? Hello. I think you were breaking or is it me? Okay. Like you were speaking to Leandra's question, what are the key values all most of these leaders have in common? Huh? Um, one of the things I have found all of them have in common, or is it me who... Okay, I can. I think Taka, you're frozen. Um, okay, one second. Let's get Hello. Taka back on the call. Hi, Taka will join us in a few. In a few seconds, yeah, I think there was an issue with the internet, yeah. So, um, so I see your questions, um, Rachel, Mukasa. I can't wait for Taka to come on and actually answer those questions. Um, Janet is saying, I really love that aspect of an effective leader is also a learning and reflective one, not one who seems to know everything. Yes, I love that. I love that, Janet. Thank you for that comment. Can't Sorry. wait for Taka to join I'm back. back. Okay. Oh, welcome. Apologies. Back, huh? Okay. <laughs> so, so very quickly on the um, on the question from Leandra. Mm -hmm. on the values. There were a couple that I saw that were quite common across the leaders. The first one I would say was deep self-awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was their self-awareness that constantly enabled them to grow and get better. Right? Um, uh, another common one was integrity, mm -hmm. alignment with their stated values. Uh, that, that came up quite common. And then you'll see some of the others get featured in the book because you'll see values is a key thing in the, in the book. So that comes out quite strongly. I, I see there was a question by Rachel in the chat, but let me take Shola and then I'll come back to Rachel. Shola? Sorry, you, you, you're welcome to go ahead and take Rachel, but I was just going to ask Taka, when you, in all your discussions, your interviews, and, and the wonderful stories, some of which you've made reference to about uh, leaders across Africa, uh, I, I am wondering, did you at any point find that the kind of traditional approach that we have to leadership, uh, uh, and again, just in terms of political leadership, what we expect of the political leader, uh, I think even today, if you look at the broad mass of, 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 of Africans, there's certain expectations, apologies for the generalization, but I hope you understand what I mean. And yet the, some of the most successful leaders that you've spoken about are ones who do indeed listen. Yes, those of integrity, uh, those willing to learn. Uh, and yet those are not necessarily going to end up being the most successful leaders, if you know what I mean. And, and, and so very often some of the traits that you have described as being signs of good and effective leadership, which certainly I buy into, can be seen as signs of weakness uh, in, in terms of the, the way in which many of us have been brought up to and many of us in Africa still view leadership. Did, did you find any kind of uh, sort of uh, 
what I call it, um, tension like that in terms of that, uh, th those perceptions, just so I'd put that uh, shit, mm. uh, you can ask later or anytime, but yeah. uh, that was a question yeah. I had. Oh, I love that. I love that question, um, Shola. And, and maybe I'll answer that as well as Rachel's and then I'll hand over to Gavin to see if he wants to add into to, to Rachel's approach. Um, the question you ask about who are those who end up being the most successful <laughs> leaders huh? and how are we defining successful? Huh? I do find that those who are occupying formal leadership roles are often, not all the time, but often, particularly I would find in the political space around governance, maybe displaying a type of leadership that you may call traditional, I call quite antiquated, and often not the type of leadership that's needed for our times. Huh? And actually, so all they're doing is occupying those formal roles, but I certainly don't define them as being successful in their leadership. Because I often say you are successful in your leadership when you are able to bring out the best in others, to influence them to achieve a shared goal. But most of the time, they're not leading anybody to achieve any shared goal. They're just occupying these leadership spaces. Yeah? And what I do find instead is that many times leadership is actually being influenced by people who might not be holding these huge formal roles of authority. And there's some learning about, and this is why if I can steal Gavin's language, the emergent leadership on this continent will not necessarily come from bounded organizations and very formal spaces. It's about people stepping up when the moment arises to exercise leadership, when the activity arises to step up and exercise leadership. But that means we constantly have to unlearn what it means to be a good leader. We have to unlearn what leadership is because I think we have been kind of inundated with, I think, a very colonial patriarchal definition of leadership that's not helping us at all. So, so that would be my, my thought on that. And, and, and Rachel, in terms of what's the key leadership approach that is most important for the continent, I would say it depends <laughs> because of what I found, there's not one. Huh? In fact, rather, I would say it's the ability to be agile and be responsive to what's really needed in the moment. Because Africa is so diverse, this continent is so diverse, the needs are so diverse, the question are we as leaders being agile and adaptable enough to really be responsive to that. But let me see if Gavin wants to add on to that one. Well, I love, I love what you've just brought, Taga. Um, it's, a, it's a hard question and maybe the, you know, to, to tie back to Shola's uh, question about uh, traditional leadership. Um, when I was, ref I went to a particular uh, person who was in a, in a, well, who was very present in the meeting, chairing a meeting that, that we had about a, a month ago, who, who's a, 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 a king of, uh, from a region in the in the eastern cape of our country and for me he epitomized some of the qualities that that we need in our leaders um, he he held space for 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 everyone to to bring their ideas he didn't judge any idea either he he um, made sure to to listen carefully or, and to invite people to explore fully what they were what they were meaning and and heard opinions on that so so the, this uh, uh, very consultative he embodied uh, reflection if you like you know listening and and working with and it it, it was indeed uh, responsive and agile uh, what what the, the way he, he was behaving so that's the one thing the other is is deep um, humanity and that inevitably means also humility of, of recognizing that there are other knowledges that have been excluded and and that that need to 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 come forward and that that uh, we don't bring uh, knowledge and and 
understanding of what needs to be done as leaders, but that we we are able to to encourage people to be the best of who they can be, provided we're doing that for ourselves. So I think uh, I'm, uh, I'm exploring the, the, the question as I'm answering. I haven't written a book like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gavin. Um, Muriel, if it's okay, we can take Sarah and then I'll respond to Sarah and Barbara at the same time. Huh? Sarah. Thanks, Taka, and my congratulations on the book. Um, I think, you know, my quest, I had a question for you, but I think it was partly um, asked by Shola uh, in the sense that I, I, I wanted to know what with all the kinds of leadership styles that you have seen emerging or that you want to see emerging, what are the key challenges that you find amongst those kinds of value-driven value, value -driven, uh, approaches uh, to leadership that you feel are so important to cultivate on the continent now? Um, and then, I, 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 Gavin, I'm really inspired by you. Um, I just, uh, you know, and, and just your observation that these systems and structures of oppression, they, they are choices that we make and that we can undo them and we can shape them uh, differently. But I, I mean, I do have to say that they are deeply, deeply, deeply entrenched systems that have been around for many, many, many years. And, um, you know, um, the investment of time and your energies and, and you know, your hopes um, to create change um, are often, you know, one step forward and then maybe three or four steps back. I want to know what keeps you, what keeps you, where do you go um, not to become cynical about what it is that you're doing? How do you keep inspired uh, to keep going? Uh, what, 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 where is that place that you go to when things are so difficult um, that you know all the resources that you have available to you don't seem to work? What, what, what happens then? I'm a, and I'm assuming, but that may not be true for you, but I'm still assuming. <laughs> Deep questions. Let me do my easy one before Gavin does his tough one. Um, Sarah, Sarah, thank you. Um, the, I'll, I'll build on, I think, some of the stuff I talked about in response to Shola in terms of what are some of the challenges in terms of living up to this type of leadership that, that I share in the book. I think one of the biggest ones, and I think I suspect Shola was uh, alluding to this, is the expectations people have of what is a good leader. Mm -hmm. It's this expectation of, you know, it's the, it's again, it's the quintessential strong, older, strong man. That's patriarchal sense. Huh? So when there you are there with your emotional intelligence and whatnot, people will be like, are you serious, please? You know, people will not move until, as we say in Ghana, you shout on them, then they will actually act. So I think part of what we're doing, I always say leadership is a dance you do with others. And part of what we're doing is we're doing so much unlearning together. We've done a particular dance one way and it has not gotten us anywhere. The music was all wrong. It's just, and so it's saying together, can we unlearn and do a different dance? But let's unlearn together to see what are new ways of doing leadership. So that is one thing I think is a big challenge. The other is very basic in terms of the big challenge is self. It's just so amazing how our inability to lead ourselves, to encourage ourselves, to love ourselves gets in the way of displaying this type of leadership. Huh? Because it's not stuff we've been taught in school. Huh? It's stuff that often we are we're not encouraged to do. So you will see there's an entire chapter on self-love because I really feel that you can't lead from um, an empty cup. 
You need to refill your tank. You need to take care of yourself. There needs to be huge levels of self-compassion and self-acceptance. But so many of us are just so incredibly hard on ourselves and that gets in the way of us shining our full light. So, so, so Sarah, I would say those are the two challenges that I've seen quite, quite common. Huh? And, and just before I hand over to Gavin, to, to Barbara, I think I talked about what inspired me was wanting to shift the narrative and to provide examples that people can learn from on this continent. You don't have to go far, they're right here. But what criteria did I use? Now you've seen two of the leaders already in this call, Sarah and Gavin, are you surprised? That how there was the, so what I did actually, including the diversity that I mentioned before, some of them were people I knew, but others were who I asked. It was through my networks to say, who are people who are examples, who are practicing this type of leadership? And you will see each chapter of the book is not featured on one person. Rather, I use them as examples very intentionally for a reason. I'm not saying any of these people are perfect. But what I'm saying is that there are aspects of their leadership that we can learn from. And I think that's the key illustration in terms of the selection of the leaders. Now, over to you, Gavin, for the difficult one. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and there, there's a lot in, yeah, that's a, indeed a difficult question. So first of all, it's, it's quite true that these, uh, the ways of organizing society are, are ingrained and, and uh, very difficult to move away from. Uh, Taga mentioned that I, amongst what the things I do is that I teach a course at the University of Cape Town, and it's called Critical Conversations on Ethics, Macroeconomics, and Organization. And one of the things that we, that we argue there is that society has basic cultural structures that have been imposed through colonialism. They come originally out of Rome, the three uh, Roman laws, and then a law of contract that was brought at the end of the 1600s. But that these, you know, it's the law of property, I won't go through, them, but Actually, these shape and condition all of society. The whole world is organized that way increasingly with globalization. And, and uh, so to look for alternatives has to be for look, to look at the, at the um, knowledge systems that have been disorganized and obliterated. And so, so we look for cognitive justice, if you like, where, where there's validation of knowledges that have been around for centuries. Um, so I don't know, I, I could go on a bit, but in fact, it is true that, that at times you can be very dispirited. I talked earlier about the will and the skill, and I think you need an optimism of, of the will, uh, you know, that, that actually we, that there's got to be a way that we can do this. And, and, um, and then the skill, what Tug has just described about caring for yourself, there's also a skill element to that, to really give the time and space and learn the techniques. So for me, um, where do I go to? I go, I go to my children. I'm, I'm father of five wonderful human beings. I go to them. I listen and learn from them. Uh, I like uh, joyous conversation. I love music. Um, when we started here, you know, we started this with, with um, Muriel, giving us some real, really good beats and that, you know, so dance and music. And then on a more serious note for the last 21 years, I've been um, learning more and more of an African spirituality. And, and uh, through that also learning more about myself and learning more, gaining more uh, skill and more, more depth in, in uh, exploring who I am, who I need to be, what, how, what, what we can become. So, so I don't know if that, if, if, if it's a difficult question indeed, but I hope that part answers it. Mm -hmm. Back to well, you, thank Muriel. You. Well, thank you so much, Gavin. This is, this is really inspiring. And I know, Taka, you have a few, I mean, it's way past our time. I know you guys yeah. want to go and enjoy your Friday. <laughs> you just had such an amazing session. But I know, Taka, you have a few announcements for us today. 
Sure, sure. Um, mm -hmm. Let me just say again, thank you so much, Gavin, for joining us. Um, really appreciated your sharing. Folks, yeah. just seeing Gavin hopefully should give you a feel huh, for what you yeah. will see in the book. Um, I mentioned also Sarah's also featured in the book, but I guess I should let you know what's coming next in terms of the book. Um, the physical launch will be here in Accra in, on June 23rd, but for those of you who are not in Accra, we will have a virtual launch on June 29th. Huh? And so please, please, please hold the date. We will be sending out all the, so if you subscribe to our mailing list, you will make sure you don't miss anything, particularly the links um, for the virtual launch, which will be on Absolutely. June 29th. Absolutely. If you would like to know more, and also you wanna keep sense of the dates, you can go to the website. I think um, any of the team will put either Robert yeah. or- um, Apolline, would you Apolline like can put on the link. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. there you go. The mm -hmm. website for the book huh? so you have more information on that so we'll keep you all appraised of that yeah and thank you i see oh there was a sarah a comment from sarah in the chat but thank you all this has been absolutely amazing and thank you for all the support you're providing around the book we'll be sure to ensure you get all a copy if you want to know how to get a copy go to the website that will also yes. let you know how to get a copy of the book after the launch yes mm -hmm. so thank you you back yeah, to you and, Ariel. yeah and the website is very simple it's like www.takaavory.com very <laughs> simple so don't miss out please go on <laughs> okay no amazing amazing and and taka you want to talk about the online courses you know yes. the online courses that we launched ah uh, yes yes mm -hmm. yes it, it's also to keep you appraised that look, you know, I know again, many folks, you read the book, but you need to think, wait a minute, how do we put this into practice? So again, we're also in the process of developing an online course based on the book that yeah. will have extra tools and tips to actually work through the kinds of challenges Shola and Sarah alluded to in terms of putting this type of leadership um, um, practice, these values, mm -hmm. this type of mm -hmm. leadership into practice, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Amazing, amazing. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being with us this afternoon. Thank you for spending your Friday afternoon with us. We had so much fun. And thank you, Taka, for this book. So timely. And I can't wait to get my hands of it on it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so if you're not yet part of the leadership uh, tribe, please join us so that we can let you know. We can remind you of the launch date in case you forget. OK, we'll tell you on time so you can join us if you're in Accra. And if you're not in a crowd, we'll have a virtual launch. So we're so excited for that. We can end with our usual picture. Taka, you know, like we have our own. Yes, uh, yes. We People, love, it means fix your face, arrange your face, arrange your hair, turn on your camera, get Let's ready for the photo. <laughs> You've hidden behind your cameras. This time, please turn it on so yes. that we can take a photo who's take going to take photo. the photos our paparazzi apolline will you take it for us yay so well, let's see let's get a few more folks before we do the photo abigail is coming on Ooh. um there Ooh. is mommy <laughs> <laughs> there's my own mommy hello mommy oh hi <laughs> <laughs> There, oh, oh Ruth is there, Auntie Ruth is there. Yes, I'm seeing lots of folks who I hadn't seen before. Oh, you're so welcome. All right, so one, two, three. <laughs> Thank nice. you, everyone. Right. Thank you all so much. Have an eh? amazing weekend. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> all right, bye. Thank you again, Gavin. Thank you so much.